Who? Okay. Good. Well, nice to talk to you. Thanks. Okay. When I was a child growing up in Trinidad as part of a large French Creole family, the staple at the end of every week was a, a dish called a maca fouchette, which is really a, a lively bubbling stew full of this and full of that. And it was served um, before a trip to the market, a market very much like this one, which is the, the Port of Spain market. Um, and it seems to me that Trinidad is a, a bit of a maca fouchette. It's certainly lively, bubbling, ever-changing, and composed of um, people from all over the place. You know, it's strong. Th this stew has the strong ingredients of, um, of West Africa, of course, and India, the, the two main ingredients. But there are all these flavorings of people from other countries, from Britain, from Lebanon, Syria, China, certainly Spain and Portugal, and intermixed throughout this stew, the unmistakable flavor of the French. De La Perouse, Ambard, Rostan, De Verte, De Gans, they had quite a presence here, these families, in the old colonial days. They, um, they generally owned land. They grew cocoa, coffee, sometimes sugar. They had big families. Um, lived in big houses. There were doctors and lawyers, um, priests, nuns, po sometimes politicians. And um, because of the French Catholic culture that they imported into the island, they built colleges and convents and schools. And of course, this Catholic culture led to the pre Lenten carnival, which is such a, a, a feature of Trinidad life, which some would say is probably their biggest contribution to Trinidad. So who are these people, these um, people from France? Why did they come here to a Caribbean island colonized by the Spanish, conquered by the British? What has their contribution been? And what is their future here? And how do they exist within the the framework of a modern Trinidad. So to find out the answers to these questions, we went all around the island, talked to a lot of people, and did a lot of listening. Jean-Marc de Pompignon is French through and through. His father was a French Creole, born and bred here, but his mother came from France itself. He's recently retired from owning a business in Port of Spain, and we interviewed him in his home. Could you give us a little idea of, of who came when and for what reasons? Well, the first, the first main batch of, of French uh, immigrants into Trinidad were, were those that came in under the cedula. The cedula being, uh, I, don't, I don't have to go into all the details of the cedula, but basically it was, uh, it was uh, an edict passed by the, by the king of, of, of Spain that encouraged uh, immigrants from the French uh, colonies to come and settle in Trinidad. And this was promoted by uh, Rome de Saint Laurent, who himself was a, was a Grenadian planter, and, uh, and came and, 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 and taught the, the Chacon, the, the, the Spanish authorities in Trinidad, to receive these people. It suited the Spanish at the time because there was nothing. Trinidad had absolutely nothing. It was wilderness. And, uh, and they were very pleased to have, uh, to, to, to develop, to see the country develop. So they, they, they created this cedula which encouraged uh, planters to come and uh, all you had to do was to swear allegiance to the king and, um, and be a Catholic. For that you got uh, land that was in direct proportion to the amount of slaves that you bought and the amount of family that you bought, which in turn created a situation where people came in here with cousins and, and that, that they never even knew about. Mm -hmm. and, um, so this is the first large batch of, of people. They came from Santo Domingo, uh, Saint Domingue, which was a French colony, which at the time was in the, in the middle of of, of, of Hugo, which developed with the um, Toussaint Louverture situation. Uh, Grenada was going into problems. Uh, Saint Lucia, which was uh, Saint Lucie, was uh, was a French colony uh, as well. And all of this was just about pre-revolution periods, where things were, were starting to warm up and. Uh, so they were all very delighted to, to, to take up this opportunity and come to Trinidad. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then the, 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 after that you had the, the situation that developed during the revolution in France itself and uh, you had um, uh, people fleeing uh, Guadeloupe and, and, and Martinique, uh, fleeing the guillotine and coming to Trinidad. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were, were so-called Republicans. I, I, I am not sure. I suppose they came in here to capitalize on the, on the potential that existed, uh, that had been created by the previous uh, wave of, of immigrants. And uh, so, so those are the main two. I mean, that, that's, that's the f basis of the French immigration into Trinidad. My grandfather came here to flee the, uh, the Montpellier eruption. Trinidad was in a huge development phase. I mean, oil had just been discovered, uh, you know, and it, there was a sort of mini boom taking place at the time. And uh, so he packed his family and, uh, and, and came to Trinidad. And, and bought land in Mayaro and in Rio Claro, and then subsequently bought his uh, his cousin, this uh, Louis de Mayac, who was his first cousin, to Trinidad, and uh, the de Mayac uh, developed on, uh, into a huge uh, French presence here in Trinidad as well. Um, so I think that those these two families are pretty well the last the the, the last uh, sort of immigrants or right. French immigrants into Trinidad yeah. in, the, in, the, in the true sense of the word. So the French came here for the same reasons that people everywhere leave their homes to start afresh in another country, to make a better life for themselves. My own interest in this topic is very personal. My mother, a French Creole for many generations back, was daughter of Valentin de Gann and of Paul de Verte. He was manager of a cocoa estate. I grew up surrounded by a large French Creole extended family, which left me with a great affection for the customs, the values and traditions of this group. And my cousin, Alex de Verte, the man who is usually behind the camera, has similar feelings. Now Alex, last year when we um, decided together to do this video project, you, you were really enthusiastic about it. Why was that? The, the whole subject of our uh, the French Creole history in Trinidad is, is, is one that, that's a personal interest to me, but also of more general interest. And I was also very aware of the fact that uh, a lot of the older people who remembered what it used to be like were dying. And unless we did something quickly to, to capture their memories and their impressions, the chances are we would have lost a lot of it. Unlike myself, who was more of a town girl and never ventured much into the bush, Alex spent many of his childhood holidays on a cocoa estate. Your experience of the estate life was on holidays, visits yes. to the estate. Grandfather was a patriarch of Rio Claro in a way, you know. He was universally known as Papa Jean. Everybody called him Papa Jean, from the, uh, the shopkeeper in, in, in the center of Rio Claro village to to his chauffeur, to everybody. They all knew him as Papa Jean in the same way that they knew my grandmother as Mama Sissi. And as a child, I would go there often on my school holidays and sort of roam the cocoa, you know. I would go with the cart and then into the cocoa when they were collecting the crop. I had a gun from a very early age, so I used to go and shoot squirrels in the cocoa. Um, I, it really was a lovely way to spend time. Uh, I, I loved the bush and I loved hunting. And uh, I used to play with the uh, estate children, particularly the, the overseer. He had a son who would take me fishing and catching birds and whatever, you know. So it was a, a great, a, a lovely life for a boy who, who, who liked the outdoors. Yes. You know? Chances are that if you were French Creole, you were involved in the growing and cultivation of cocoa. What does a cocoa estate look like, and what was it like to live on one? I'm sitting on the steps of an estate house in central Trinidad with Basil de Verte and his sister Doreen Mary. The house is empty now, but it was once full of children, a baker's dozen of them. French Creole families were traditionally large. Well, the earliest memories I could remember is uh, a member of a big family, and we never we never searched for anything to do during the day. If it rained, we got inside the house and we'd play hide and seek or whatever you want. Or if it was fine, we'd any cocoa shooting squirrels. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, the girls, what they did, I don't know. They went up in the room and played with dolls, I don't know. But 
There was never a dull moment, mm -hmm. never. And if we got fed up of this estate, we used to go to another estate belonging to another part of the family, and we used to raise hell over there and come back here again. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. this, this is how it went. So tell me what got your father interested in the traditional life of the planter. Why didn't he... I'd, but he didn't grow up on an estate. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think he had much choice. He, he either was a professional man of some description, or a cocoa planter man. Uh, he loved that, planter. you know. He but, loved the cocoa. But he actually, he actually adored cocoa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what made him stain it. I would imagine. But to get him to get a job, to get going in life, I believe the only one, the only avenue open to him was a manager on a cocoa So you could either be a doctor or a lawyer yeah. or whatever, a professional man or a cocoa planter. Yeah, so, yeah. so they didn't tend to go into business? No. No, no open up shops no, and so on. No, the the business, are not business people. No, no, no. I know it by myself. <laughs> um, no, business, uh, the business was, the business was more the Scotch and the, the English was administrative and the Scotch were the with the merchants, with the, uh -huh. yes. the real merchants. So the Devete stuck to cocoa or, yes. or the profession. Yeah. And and they used to look down on the ones that were traders. Oh really? <laughs> yes. The trader was not. The trader <laughs> was not in so the. So you had avenue. to be. In, you had to have land oh, yes, or you profession. Yes, yeah, that Otherwise you were opinion. looked down on. Yeah, yes. More or less. That's Owning land was a key factor in the early French settlement in Trinidad. Count Lupino, Chevalier de Verteuil, Chevalier de Gan de la Chancellerie de la Falaise, many of them were titled, and according to that code, it was not true to your class to run a business or to have a trade. Either you were a professional man, a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest, or you owned land, just like in the old days before the revolution. Sometimes you did very well when the price of cocoa was high, and life was a pleasant round of social rituals. Mm -hmm.